of what it takes to actually pull off uh, complicated issues. And he's been really the force behind uh, the consumer owned utility bill, LD 1646. And um, with that, I think I'll just pass. I, I really got to know him a lot in this past year, and it's been a sheer pleasure. So, and take it away, Seth. Okay. I will do my best. Well, it's great to be with you all. Um, thank you, Sue and Matt and Jonathan for organizing this and for the invitation. Um, very glad to hear you, you have better than expected attendance. And I hope this is uh, this only grows from here. It's a great concept and obviously a very um, timely uh, week to be embarking on these community conversations uh, with um, Earth Day tomorrow. Um, I would be remiss, speaking of uh, uh, holidays, um, to not acknowledge Yom HaShoah um, tonight. I, I think it ends at 7.30 at night. Um, uh, today was the uh, was Holocaust Remembrance Day and um, a time to remember um, uh, 11 million people who were slaughtered in Germany in the Holocaust. And, you know, it really kind of puts our current pandemic into perspective, um, you know, and uh, I think obviously um, this is a, a challenging time as well, um, but uh, if we could get through World War II and the Holocaust, I think we're gonna get through this as well. And there are uh, challenges that are in front of us, which are, I think, um, arguably even bigger um, uh, than the current pandemic. I, I would count climate change among those things. And it's a big motivator for me in my legislative work um, I also work here. Uh, this is I'm working talking to you from my day job where I work at a lab um, involved in um, more sustainable uh, food uh, for the world, and uh, we specialize in aquatic animal health. But um, more importantly, we have good broadband here, so I'm <laughs> I'm here for that reason. And uh, I brought my sign with me um, so that you could all be reminded of LD 1646. Uh, it's one of the topics I'll be talking about, and the first two that uh, Sierra Club team asked me to speak on were the um, uh, legislative accomplishments re relating to clean energy from the 129th legislature, which just wrapped up its work on March 17th, and um, also uh, the work of the Energy Working Group of the Climate Council. Um, I am on the Energy Working Group of the Council. Um, the Climate Council was created by this last legislature and um, it has a number of working groups. The energy working group obviously um, is going to be important to uh, um, addressing our climate needs. So it's those three things, uh, legislative accomplishments, energy working group, and LD 1646, the consumer owned utility effort. And I'll do them in that order. Um, so uh, as you know, the legislature works in two year cycles. We have just completed our work for this past two year cycle, although a number of measures uh, were left undone because we had to end early because of the pandemic. So um, we accomplished a lot, but there are some things left on the table. We hope to maybe go back in July or August or September and finish those. If we don't, then um, those bills will die and they will have to sort of start the cycle over with a new two-year cycle and a new legislature because we're all up for re-election uh, in uh, November and uh, typically a third of the legislature turns over. So there is a big question mark uh, uh, as to those remaining bills. Uh, but what we did accomplish so far uh, wa were, uh, and I'll just list a few of them, uh, we uh, reopened the term sheet for the Maine Aquaventus offshore wind project uh, that the University of Maine has been working so hard on so that we can move forward with the university's uh, very innovative floating platform technology. Um, that's something that Paul LePage, as you may recall, uh, put the kibosh on um, and uh, by intervening with the PUC, we uh, reversed that and uh, that process is now moving forward. A little late, but it is moving forward. Um, likewise, we reversed uh, the Paul LePage uh, PUC's decision on uh, solar gross metering, uh, which is just a great name. It kind of says it all. Um, gross metering was gross and it, it was not, uh, it was very anti-solar um, and it, it didn't help anyone, you know, either the solar owner or their neighbor who um, can benefit from a rooftop solar. 
um, next door to them. Um, we all benefit because it helps to drive down rates as long as it's done right. And uh, so net metering was restored, um, the former policy. And we also uh, went forward with a very substantial uh, procurement bill around solar, larger grid scale and community scale solar. Um, and so there's a lot of that in the pipeline. I think especially the larger grid scale work will continue even despite the pandemic. It is a little more challenging for some of the um, more intimate uh, uh, clean energy work. Um, uh, you know, is climbing up on someone's roof is probably going to be um, okay. It gets a little dicier with things like heat pumps and efficiency installation. So we are seeing, and you may have seen the Press Herald article, um, I think it was yesterday's Press Herald, maybe it was today, by Tux Turkle talking about the challenges there. But, um, but we, we are seeing a, a real renaissance around clean energy in general. And it's, a lot of that is because of that work, those bills that we passed. And then one additional uh, bill that really will help boost the larger grid scale renewable um, procurements here in Maine uh, was the enactment of a bill to increase our renewable portfolio standard. And the renewable portfolio standard is, um, is where we, we require that a certain amount of the energy that is bought on our behalf um, as electricity ratepayers um, is renewable. And uh, Maine's current requirement is 40% uh, under the new bill, it will ramp up to 80% renewable by 2030 with a goal, not a statutory requirement, but a long-term goal of 100% renewable by 2050. Now I, I need to clarify because it's, it's easy to misunderstand. Uh, that does not mean that all of our energy is renewable. It means that all of our electricity is renewable. So it, doesn't, it does nothing about cars um, and, and uh, other forms of transportation that burn fossil fuels. It does nothing about oil furnaces. We're one of the most dependent uh, states, if not the most dependent on um, petroleum-based uh, heating. And um, those are real challenges. Um, so that's a, probably a pretty good segue to the Climate Council and, and the importance of, of, of that work. Another bill that we did enact was the Climate Council. It created a very large, roughly 30 member um, panel, uh, which is to advise the governor on um, how we can attain our climate goals. And climate goals were enacted, which would get us to 80% um, uh, fewer emissions than what we had as of 1990 by the year 2050. Um, so that's, that's economy-wide. That's, that's the, the economy-wide goal that includes transportation and includes building heating and cooling. Um, and, and there's some debate about how, how we measure industrial emissions. Those are important too, and I think we should absolutely include those. Um, so, so now the real work begins, right? Because that's, that larger challenge is much more substantial than electricity. Electricity, uh, which my committee in the legislature oversees, is only 9% of our overall emissions as a state. So the real challenge is transportation. That's over 50% of our emissions. And, um, and then building heating and cooling is next with over 30%. Uh, and then you have industrials and, and uh, the rest again is electricity. So uh, that is the, the, the larger challenge that the Climate Council is, is looking at. They're also looking at our sort of our agricultural practices, our land use, um, you know, patterns of, of, uh, of development, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, but with respect to energy, um, my working group of the Climate Council, the subgroup that I'm on, is really where the rubber hits the road on how do we produce enough clean energy uh, to power our transportation fleet, uh, which is currently obviously not renewable at all, um, and uh, also to heat and cool buildings and to power industrial processes. That's the real challenge. And it represents a massive, probably uh, uh, at least a five and a half fold increase um, over what we, we produce now with our overall uh, generation. And, um, so that's a whole lot more um, offshore wind turbines or solar panels or, you know, you name your favorite renewable that we need to bring online in order to get there. And um, we need to do that as quickly as possible. So very substantial investment needs to be made. And um, how we do that is something that the Energy Working Group is, is uh, working hard on. Now, the Energy Working Group includes people who have vested interests. It includes uh, 
the CEO of Summit Natural Gas, for example, um, who, you know, may, maybe has a perspective because he oversees a utility that does natural gas. Um, it includes uh, Eric Stineford, who's the vice president of Central Maine Power. Um, and obviously he has a certain vested interest. Um, but there are lots of, of uh, people there who are more in the public interest as well. They're environmental folks. Um, and uh, Dan Burgess, the governor's um, policy director on energy, is co-chairing it with Ken Colburn, who is from Bar Harbor and has a great background as an environmental regulator in the state of New Hampshire. And also, also interestingly, been involved in um, energy co-ops. So it's a very mixed group, but I think one that does hold, does hold some promise to make some good recommendations. Um, I wouldn't expect, you know, um, a panacea from us, but I'm hoping that we can really advance the conversation as part of the energy working group. Uh, and that work is unfolding. Um, I'm hoping that we will be uh, wrapping, I think we are hoping that we'll be wrapping up our recommendations to the larger Climate Council uh, by the end of May and then letting the Climate Council sift through those recommendations from the different working groups and uh, produce their own larger recommendation for the, the next legislature in terms of short-term measures that we need to take in, to keep the ball moving. Um, and it, it is a marathon and not a sprint, uh, but, but we have to keep moving. We, we have to maintain a, a, the strongest pace that we possibly can if we're going to do our part as a state uh, to address the climate challenge because we have so much at stake ourselves in this challenge. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's about our kids and our grandkids, yes, but even in our lifetime, we expect to see massive, massive, um, very consequential and very uh, troubling uh, changes if we don't um, change course now. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll end there, but happy to take questions on either of those two things. One more topic before we get to questions is I, I, I was asked to talk about the consumer and utility effort. And um, some of you, I think, are on the call because you're interested in replacing Central Maine Power and perhaps Amera Maine also um, with a consumer owned utility. That is what LD 1646 would do. Um, I put forward the bill last May. We had a great public hearing. Thanks to all of you who attended and testified and support. Um, consumer owned utilities are a proven superior model. And especially going into the very challenging future uh, that we expect um, and addressing the climate challenge and also taking advantage of the opportunities that that, that challenge holds because every crisis also has opportunities hidden inside of it. Um, a consumer -owned utility would be a tra really transformative um, a change uh, for Maine to make and it would really position us to be a leader in the clean energy future. Um, Consumer and utilities are not for profit. They are typically um, accountable to, to the people. Um, they can be owned as a co-op or they can be um, quasi-governmental, kind of like your local you know, water district maybe, if you have one of those. Um, there are five consumer owned utilities, excuse me, there are eight consumer owned utilities here in Maine. Um, some of them are co-ops, uh, but uh, Madison Electric, for example, up in Madison, attracted backyard farms because it has cheaper and more reliable electricity than neighboring CMP. Um, Kennebunk Light and Power is a fantastic, uh, very popular consumer and utility down in Kennebunk, obviously. We have Holton, we have uh, Callis and uh, Baileyville, and, and a, a, actually that that. Uh, is a co-op which serves um, an area twice the size of Rhode Island. Uh, we have Van Buren, we have Vinyl Haven, we have Matinicus and Monhegan. So um, lots of consumer and utilities here in Maine, but they are um, still relatively small compared to Emera and CMP. Across the country, uh, it's actually a little different. Out west, there are a lot more consumer and utilities and um, it, all of one state, Nebraska, is entirely consumer owned. And there are um, large, large portions, uh, the majority in some cases, of other states, uh, Washington and Iowa and, and many others, um, where public power um, really took hold um, in part because they were very rural and the investor-owned utilities didn't, didn't want to go there, so they never, they never bothered. Um, and in the 30s, they finally took the, uh, took the ball, you know, ball into their own hands and said, we're going to do this with a co-op. Um, in other cases, it was because of uh, a visionary um, like George Norris of Nebraska, who worked with FDR and created 
uh, the, the Tennessee Valley Authority and the Bonneville Power Authority and the law that made all of Nebraska publicly owned. Um, so the advantage primarily is that they are locally controlled and uh, that they are have a lower cost capital. Consumer utilities are able to access capital at a much lower cost. And we need to make, as I mentioned earlier, massive, massive investments in the grid um, to improve reliability and to conduct all of the uh, clean, new clean electricity that we plan to generate. We also need to uh, make massive investments in generation. And so, although LD 1646 does not propose it, uh, we're, we're also talking now about uh, uh, public investment, consumer owned investment in generation as well. So that some of that offshore wind, some of that solar, uh, some of those other resources could be procured at a lower cost of capital and could, could um, not uh, involve a massive uh, profit uh, center for um, faraway investors, but rather could really be generating jobs here in Maine. We're going into a very challenging time economically, so we expect to need jobs. This is going to be a bit of a, uh, certainly a massive recession, if not a depression, and our state will need um, opportunities like these uh, to, to generate not just clean energy, but also to generate jobs. Um, and, and one last thing I can't uh, resist mentioning uh, because my committee also oversees uh, telecommunications is when you own the poles, you also own um, the, the, um, the ability to bring fiber optic telecommunications infrastructure to the parts of Maine that don't have it. And we are seeing many people unable to access telehealth, unable to access uh, digital learning um, whether they're students or adults who are trying to um, change their, improve their job skills right now, um, people involved in meetings like this, trying to work from home. Uh, and uh, because roughly 15% of Maine uh, does not have access to any kind of high-speed internet, and as I mentioned, I had to come into my, my workplace today to, to speak to you um, because otherwise you wouldn't be seeing me. You'd, you might, you'd, hopefully you'd be hearing me, but that's it. Um, we, we really need to, to do something about broadband as well. That's also a clean energy opportunity because if people can telecommute, if, if you if can work from home or get your me medicine, uh, you're checking with your doctor from home or learn from home, um, you're cutting down on that transportation piece that I mentioned is over half of our overall emissions. Um, just quickly, the, the main state uh, uh, government employees are about 85% uh, telecommuting right now. And that's an incredible statistic because in, in the space of about two weeks, we went from um, a, a negligible weight rate of telework to 85%. I actually put in a bill uh, last year also on telecommuting and asked that Maine create a statutory goal of 30% telecommuting by 2030. And you know what? Um, the the uh, human resources people in state government said, yeah, that's that's going to be tough. I don't think we can really do that. Um, you know, I, I think we, we, let's let's study this and and we'll you know we'll figure out what's possible. So you know we compromised. We we agreed on a study, and uh, and 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 that's so this study is is currently uh, so it's supposed to be taking place on whether we can get to thirty percent by twenty thirty, and yet because of the pandemic, we saw in in a, in the space of two weeks. Um, an 85% telecommuting rate. Um, but again, there are challenges involved with that. It is not perfect. A big part of that is our lack of fiber uh, optic infrastructure and, tele and um, the ability to work from home for people that don't have internet access. And for, for um, the wonderful main base providers of uh, broadband, uh, such as GWI or Axiom or LCI or Pioneer, um, these wonderful, small, scrappy uh, telecoms, they are um, looking at uh, roughly 25 to, to 40 percent of the cost of getting fiber to you is attaching to the poles. Now, guess who owns most of the poles? Well, CMP and Ameri-Maine, and yes, also uh, Consolidated, which used to be Fairpoint, which used to be Verizon, owns quite a few of the poles as well. But my point is, if we can uh, go forward with a bold and visionary consumer-owned utility that can not only invest in poles and wires, um, but can also invest in generation and can also make it possible for uh, us to improve uh, broadband infrastructure 
and access to um, the internet for the last mile for the, the folks who still don't have it, uh, we can really um, transform our state. And Position Maine is a leader in uh, the, the future, the, the very challenging future um, that we confront. Um, I think Maine has real opportunities here if we play our cards right. So uh, I wanna wrap it up there. Um, I think that's about all I wanted to share with you and make sure that we have time for questions. Thank you, Seth. Um, and there's some questions coming in on the stack chat box, but before we get to those, I think I saw one hand up, uh, Suzanne. Suzanne, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question? <clears throat> if you can't, then um, yeah. maybe just I, add it I, to the uh, chat. Oh. I believe I've unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Yep. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Seth, for doing this. This is a huge opportunity for us and great for me to hear, um, but not only the recap, but the future. My big issue, I guess, in any of this is how we underestimate the power of energy efficiency. And in particular, I think the combination of energy efficiency in partnership with renewables because we tend to separate the two into two different camps when in fact, I believe the real efficiency, if you will, and yeah. the real opportunity is the combination of both. And so would there be perhaps a consideration in the future of not only a, a, a renewable standard, but an efficiency standard that is a combined standard, efficiency renewable standard, that we can begin to think about a combined effort within the idea of, of planning with the grid resource. Because again, I think as we go towards electrification, the real, uh, again, uh, synergy of forces here is the combination of all of the above. Yeah, I would just say amen to that. Um, you know, one reason I think that I um, don't talk about efficiency as much as I used to, Suzanne, when, when you and I were um, we're, we're hanging out together more and it, you, you did some tremendous uh, work on that and still still are doing that. Thank you for it. Um, I, I've been um, I've just been so pleased by uh, the work of the Efficiency Maine Trust and it's not that we can't do more there um, but Maine is really fortunate to have the Efficiency Maine Trust and a very powerful maximum achievable cost effectiveness test where within the electricity sector, at least, uh, we are really going out and getting as much efficiency as is uh, determined to be cost effective. But can we do more? Absolutely. I think one of the opportunities there, is, for example, is around um, uh, building codes and energy standards for, for new buildings, um, as well as opportunities to retrofit our very, very old um, housing stock here uh, we do need to do more, and um, part of the challenge has been funding that. It is hard in a uh, utility model, uh, in a in a uh, revenue bond model, to, um, to 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 finance that. I think uh, it may be possible. I had a proposal back. I'm sure you remember Suzanne back in 2011 or so that would have used revenue bonds at, uh, in addition to a, a small uh, surcharge on heating oil, and that m would have really been um, a, a, a massive um, engine uh, to propel forward our, our efficiency work. But um, I, I think the other piece is, is just around the smart smart grid and better uses of um, the the energy that we do transmit over poles and wires. And then we do have this uh, advanced metering infrastructure, these smart meters, which are supposed to help with that, but they have not helped. We have not seen savings from them. They've been nothing but a headache um, and, a, and, a, and a massive um, new profit center for the utilities. So um, if we can put all of this together, uh, then I think we can really get somewhere. Thank you for mentioning efficiency. It is the cheapest and the cleanest source of power. And I, uh, I, I appreciate that you mentioned it and appreciate what you're doing, Suzanne, to uh, move that forward nationally. Well, Seth, thank you very much. I'll be back in touch. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And uh, I'm happy to just kind of go down the chat box. We have a couple questions here. Uh, one's more, of a, maybe it was a comment, but is the legislature going to be called back in a special session at some point this year? Do you know that yet? Or 
have you mentioned yeah, that? That is uh, to be determined. Great question. And, um, you know, obviously a lot depends on the availability of uh, testing. We are nowhere near where we need to be in terms of the availability of tests. And uh, we're going to let the, the public health experts determine when we are there. Uh, but what we know from them is that we're not there right now. And uh, they're just not getting, you know, I think the Abbott test, um, uh, Dr. Shah at the CDC um, had some comments about it today. Um, it, it, even that test is, is somewhat limited in terms of its um, ability to generate uh, a false um, negative. And um, we don't have enough of them. The first order from the state, uh, we, we, we ended up getting about 5% of what we ordered. So until we have massive new um, testing availability, preferably antibody testing. Also, we need a, a whole army of contact tracers um, to do it safely. We can't reopen the, the, the economy and um, expect anything but disaster. So um, I think it's safe to say that when the economy is um, safe to reopen, when you see businesses starting to reopen, uh, we'll be in a better position to, to talk with the governor about bringing the legislature back into session. I certainly hope um, to come actually, back. There are I a lot of things I want to work on, um, uh, but I'm not, I'm, right now we do not have a date uh, to come back and it is the governor's call as to when and whether we come back. Okay, yeah. Um. And, a and actually this is Eric. Um, just to let you know, that's not what I heard. I heard publicly, she has said they are calling the legislature back in. Okay, thank you, Eric. I, I had not heard that yet. Yeah, she she's already said it publicly because because there's a judicial appointment um, that's come up uh, with the um, with the with the departure of the chief justice of the state supreme court, and at that point, she said publicly she will be calling you guys back in at some point later this year. I certainly hope that's the case. Um, did she give? I, I assume she didn't give a date uh, because right. I would have heard about it. Um, but I'm glad to hear that there was an indication that we would come back in. One thing I should uh, mention, though, as a caveat to that, is that even if the governor does call us back in, it could be for a limited purpose, such as the confirmation of a new uh, Supreme Court uh, justice. Uh, it does not need to be necessarily um, a, a, a blank check to vote on all of the legislation that remains before us. And for safety reasons, she may or may not uh, want to um, encourage us to vote on every remaining bill, um, even the uh, the ones that you know you and I might care about deeply, such as LD 1646. So stay tuned uh, is my best uh, my best answer on that one. Thank you, Seth, and thank you, Eric. Um, Dave asks, uh, what's the climate of bipartisan support on all the issues that you outlined? Um, you know, I, I think we did get a few um, Republicans to vote uh, in favor of a few of those bills. Um, the, uh, the solar bill in particular, and I think also the Climate Council bill. Uh, but, you know, we have not seen a lot of Republican support for um, more aggressive uh, renewable portfolio standards and more um, more transformative proposals like LD 1646, the consumer and utility bill. Um, you know, I, I, I will say that uh, lots of Republicans who I talk to on the street um, uh, or even folks that approach me um, unsolicited uh, uh, speak very highly of the idea that we should control our power locally um, that uh, decisions about something as important as our power should be made locally and not in, in a far away, distant overseas boardroom, which is, of course, currently the case with both CMP and Amira Maine. So, um, I think I think re Republicans in the state house are um, in a pretty unique bubble. I mean, you know, let's face it, we're we're all in kind of a bubble there. We tend to hear a lot from uh, lobbyists and, and relatively little from the people. Uh, but that's one reason that we're also talking about the possibility of a, of a referendum 
if we need to go there, if we can't get um, all of the Democrats to support it, or if maybe Republicans take over the uh, state, one, one house, one branch of a state legislature next year, um, I think a, a ballot question is certainly a, a possibility as well. And there are many, including in the Sierra Club, who are discussing that as a, as a real possibility. Great. Um, Nolan Mike asks, what would be the benefits of buying out CMP rather than forming new smaller energy companies around the state? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So um, a utility is, is a little bit different from a company. Um, you know, just, just uh, th this may be a, um, a point you're, that, that, uh, that everyone's already familiar with, but I, 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 I have to underscore that a utility is a monopoly. It is not a free market business in any way, shape or form. So um, the idea of having a public utilities commission is to supposedly impose the discipline that the free market would otherwise impose. That's what's called the regulatory bargain. And so every utility, whether it's consumer owned or um, investor owned, is given a certain service territory, which is exclusive. So its customers are captive to that utility. And it is possible that we could create a lot of smaller consumer owned utilities around the, around the state. But one real issue with that would be equity. The rural areas are much harder, much more expensive to serve. You need many, many more poles and many more miles of wire to serve an area like Piscataquis County than you do, say, Cumberland County. So it would work very well for Cumberland County to have its own power utility. It would work less well for Piscataquis. Um, it can be done. Now, I, I mentioned Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative. They do a great job, um, despite the challenging circumstances uh, of serving a very rural area, twice the size of Rhode Island, with only 12,500 customers in down East Maine. Um, so it's not impossible, but it is more expensive. Their rates are higher than the rates of Madison or Kennebunk. And, that's, and the reason is the, the rural nature. There are also efficiencies involved with a larger utility. Um, you, you can uh, move resources around more effectively if you have uh, a storm that hits a particular part of the state quickly, you know, very, very, um, very badly. Um, you can move your crews uh, from the areas that were less hard hit to the areas that uh, are hard hit. And you can also um, keep your workers busy, uh, make sure there is enough work for them um, by serving um, a larger area of the state and moving, moving uh, specialists around um, you know, who might you know do a particular kind of work like installing tree wire um, one uh, one very simple technology that we could use to improve our worst in the nation reliability if we could invest affordably is more um, coated wire uh, tree wire it's called which when a tree branch touches it does not short the electricity supply and it, it's also stronger. It can even hold the weight of an entire tree in many cases. So um, a larger utility would be better positioned to make those kinds of investments. It's not that you couldn't do it with a smaller utility, um, but one last efficiency is they could go to the bond houses uh, in New York and sell revenue bonds um, at very attractive rates um, a little more easily because they'd be looking at a, a, a larger investment that the bond banks would be more interested in um, in buying. And that's really one of the key, I, I mentioned access to low cost capital. That's one of the key factors. Um, in, investors like the tax exempt, um, low interest but predictable revenue that they can get from buying uh, municipal bonds and uh, tax exempt utility bonds, such as those issued by consumer and utilities. So, um, that's what we're talking about when I talk about low cost capital. I hope I answered the question. I should probably let others ask their questions. Thanks, Seth. Um, there was a comment just in support of broadband, especially after 
everything that's going on. And I'm glad you talked about that earlier. Um, yes. There's a question from Philip. I understand that CMP does not own electric generating facilities. Does this make it easier to transition to sustainable generation if this becomes consumer owned or are the commitments to purchase from current sources difficult to terminate? Yeah, so the, the commitments to purchase, we do have long-term contracts to purchase from um, for-profit, uh, investor-owned, uh, clean energy um, generators. And those would not go away. We've made a commitment, we would honor that commitment. But as I mentioned, we need to at least uh, quintuple the amount of clean energy that is currently on our grid if we're going to decarbonize our economy. And that's a pretty Herculean challenge. It will require an unprecedented level of clean energy investment, and it will require it now and at a sustained uh, rate, uh, probably an in increasing rate of, of, of investment um, going forward to 2050, if, if that's our goal. So. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's probably room for both uh, publicly financed uh, clean energy investments, such as uh, a consumer-owned utility could make, as well as um, uh, investment by the private sector. Uh, but again, you, you're you're going to be um, paying a lot more for that that uh, for-profit um, private sector investment. And I'm just not clear that our state will be able to afford it. We, we spend six billion a year already on energy. Our, our lower income individuals uh, pay, um, some of them pay uh, a fifth of their overall household budget on energy as it is. And it's a very high energy burden uh, relative to other parts of the country. Um, our industrial uh, sector is very um, sensitive to electricity costs, and we need to be careful in that respect as well. So um, if we're going to do this as a relatively low income state, we need to be able to do it affordably. And if we do it right, we can, we can generate that energy and generate those jobs. Um, if we do it wrong, it could fall apart. You know, we, we may actually not get there at all. Great. Um, Mal asked, do you have any thoughts on grid scale storage? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, um, I, uh, I should have mentioned storage before. Um, I think that the Energy Working Group is going to make some additional recommendations around storage. We do need to have more um, uh, thoughtful uh, and strategic investment in storage. I think that's one of the, one of the great opportunities also for um, consumer owned investment um, because it's, it's still kind of coming online. Um, battery storage is not the only solution, um, but it might be the most sort of, um, you know, off the shelf uh, solution to, to, for, the, for the near term investment. Um, there's some really interesting stuff being done in, store, in uh, storage around clean fuels, where um, you're, you're using um, molecules to store power. Um, rather than electrons to, to send power. The advantage of a molecule, of course, is once you've created it, it can be stored um, like gasoline. So I'm talking obviously about things like hydrogen or uh, methane, which can be created uh, by bacteria uh, from hydrogen. Hydrogen is probably the, the most promising uh, in the near term. And it can be either stored for use in hydrogen vehicles, um, probably has some real potential around um, you know, the, uh, the, the larger um, transportation fleet, um, you know, the, for, for freight vehicles, for example, um, as well as it can be injected into our natural gas pipelines and used to supplement uh, the natural gas supply, which is still, I think, in the near term, going to be uh, a significant portion of our overall energy use, hopefully um, decreasing over time. Uh, but, you know, that's, uh, that's to be determined. So yeah, storage is a great one. I, I, I really appreciate the question. Yeah, these are, um, these are great. We have a, probably a handful more. Um, Katie asks, what can we do right now to support LD1646? Hey, great question, Katie. Um, so uh, I would suggest that you, um, if, if you already um, 
know about it, um, then you, you probably know that um, maybe you've, maybe you've done some of these things, but um, all right, let, let me, let me back up. If you're just learning about it and you want to learn more, um, educating yourself is definitely a great first step. Go to um, publicpower.org. That's the, uh, the national association of the um, consumer and utilities around the country and check out their website, publicpower.org. Um, we can follow up with these links. Go to um, bit.ly forward slash main power, capital M, capital P. Um, that's a, a sort of a website that we created with uh, links relating to LD 1646. And there are links there on how you can support it. You can contact your state legislators. You can contact your governor. You can donate. Um, all of those uh, links from bit.ly forward slash main power, capital M, capital P. And again, we'll send that out after the call. If not, put it on the chat. Um, and uh, we have bumper stickers. Uh, you may not be driving a lot right now, but hopefully you will be later <laughs> uh, with your very clean uh, vehicle. Um, and if you, if you want a bumper sticker, um, you can uh, contact uh, me and, uh, or I'll send a, maybe if we can send out a link, Matt, after this, um, an email after this with some of this information, that might be the best way to get out there. Um, sure. A letter to the editor, once you've kind of armed yourself with information, would be tremendous. And, um, you know, they, they do get read. Policymakers really do pay attention to letters to the editor. Um, it's the second most read um, page in the newspaper after the, opinion, after the front page. And um, I guess one last thing is donations. We definitely need uh, funding. Uh, the Sierra Club has been terrific, and uh, we have had a couple of uh, very generous donors step up and fund uh, John Brodigam as a part-time uh, sort of employee of this effort. Um, he's done a tremendous job of, of uh, organizing us, and we want to keep that going. Uh, so a donation, a generous donation at whatever level you can afford would be a terrific way to move us forward. Um, we we need uh, probably uh, uh, in the six figures over the next few months to keep this this effort going forward. So I would say um, you can try to donate at our new website, and I'm going to give you a link to our new website for donations. But uh, please keep in mind this website is is still um, in the works. It is uh, under construction, but the and I've I've personally had some problems with the donation link. But you can try to donate there. And uh, that link is mainpowerformainpeople.org. And the four is the number. Again, mainpowerformainpeople.org with the, the number four. Um, so that's a good place to donate. But again, we're, we're still working on the website itself. So um, some of those other resources may be more complete for your um, arming yourself with information. Thanks for that great question, Katie. Um, that's great. Thank you. And there's a couple more. Yeah, still a handful. Um, these kind of all relate to public buy-in for the consumer owned utility and the cost. Um, but Steve says one of the big opportunities for Maine is to move as quickly as possible toward an electric economy with electric vehicles and home heat pumps. We can move the economy to a low fossil fuel economy. Selling this idea would greatly help the public buy-in. Um, and you may, and I'll just read the next one as well. Um, utility revenues are significantly threatened due to coronavirus epidemic and insecurity of payment in our rate base. This seems like a challenging time for the government to take over the utility system. How are you taking these changes in the landscape into consideration? And the third one that kind of relates to the buy-in is um, from Celeste speaking to the costs of purchasing CMP in Amer Maine. So I hope I didn't do too many at once there, but they seem uh, related. Uh, can you repeat the last question? Uh, could you just speak to the cost of purchasing CMP and Amera for Mainers to consider? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry. Give me the first. Give me the first question again. I am sorry. Yeah. No. I, that's okay. I wasn't sure. Um, First one's about electric vehicles and home heat pumps. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, right. As being so, helping the buy-in. 
Got it. Got it. Um, so let me, I'll start with that one. That is a great, great point. And, and um, I kind of alluded to it earlier, um, but that is how we decarbonize. There's no question that the lion's share of decarbonization in Maine and, and, and everywhere will come from a shift to electric vehicles and to some extent, hydrogen vehicles. As you know, some automakers are moving more in that direction. Um, but electrification is, is uh, where we expect most of it to come from in transportation. And, also, and likewise, uh, electrification of building heating and cooling. Um, that is how we take the fossil fuels out of transportation and out of building heating and cooling, and ultimately also out of the industrial sector. That's where the, emiss the big emissions are in this state right now and in, uh, in the global economy, and it's where we need to, um, to go with our electricity. Um, but it's not enough to just plug in your electric vehicle. You also need to make sure that the electric vehicle is being powered by clean electricity. And when we're increasing by a factor of five, the energy that's demanded of our grid, uh, we are likewise increasing by a factor of five, the amount of renewable generation that we need to bring online. So it's, it, it's a both and question. We need to uh, electrify the economy and we need to uh, decarbonize generation as we do that. Um, so, that's a great point, and I, and I hope that that helped to sort of clarify the importance of public ownership of, of the grid and the, the access to low-cost capital and local control, because the grid really is the backbone, uh, the foundation, if you will, of our clean energy future. Um, so let me talk about uh, the cost to purchase CMP in Ameramaine. It's a, it's, a, it's a large number. It's in the billions. It's, um, it, that will be the subject of litigation um, when we go forward with this, and ultimately will probably be settled by the law court. Um, but I would put the number uh, somewhere around six or seven billion dollars. Uh, it's a it's a big number. It's it's roughly what we spend on energy in a year in the state. But it's also uh, a number that we can finance. And remember, we can do it at a much lower interest rate than what we're currently paying as part of our electricity bills every day that we turn on a light switch. Um, currently, when you turn on that light switch, your bill includes uh, a, a between, a, between a 10 and a 13% and a return on equity for the investors of CMP and Ameramaine. Um, they include oil-based sovereign wealth funds from uh, the country of Qatar, uh, the country of Norway, large investment banks from Spain, and many other investors around the world. BlackRock is another big investor in CMP and Iberdro Iberdrola, which owns Avant Grid, which owns CMP. So you're paying for that very high interest rate as part of your utility bill. They also have some uh, taxable debt, which um, when you fold that in, the overall interest you're paying for every pole, every wire, every substation, every transformer, um, every investment in the grid that CMP has made, you're paying uh, a total of all in of about an 8% interest rate annualized. That's a, that's a very substantial uh, uh, um, cost to all of us. And we don't really think about it because um, it's just baked into our electricity rates. And electricity is a relatively inexpensive form of, of energy, but Maine has one of the highest uh, electricity costs in the nation, um, in part because of the way that our uh, New England ISO um, has prioritized reliability. Um, you wouldn't know it here in Maine, but uh, they, they say they have. Um, and also because um, uh, we, we, we allow, uh, because of the constitution of the United States, we allow this very high rate of return for investors. Notice that I mentioned the Constitution of the United States. We don't have a choice. We can't just improve our, our Public Utilities Commission and expect this whole problem to go away. It won't because there's uh, a standard in federal case law, federal jurisprudence um, called the HOPE standard. And there's another one called the Bluefield standard. These are, these are Supreme Court cases that were decided in the 1920s and the 1940s. And they require 
that we pay a very healthy uh, market calibrated rate of return uh, to the investors in investor owned utilities um, and bake it into the rates. We don't have a choice that has to happen. So when, I, when we talk about the, the acquisition cost of CMP and Maine, the best way to think of it really is, is it's like you're, you're purchasing a home um, that you are renting for a whole lot of money and your, your monthly um, mortgage payment is going to be a lot less expensive than your rent was. That's, that's really the, the comparable here. Um, you finance it out over time. And by the way, one of the great things about now is um, that the, um, the, the federal reserve rate is less than 1%. It's an incredibly good time to make these kinds of public investments because we can get such incredibly low cost capital. Um, the new utility would be borrowing against the future revenue of the utility. There's no, there are no tax dollars involved. It's a very common misconception. The utilities try to stir that up. Um, opponents of the bill try to claim that it's going to involve tax money. It's not. It's, it, you're, you're just borrowing against the future revenue. Um, so uh, the investors uh, really like this investment because everybody pays their electricity bill. They know that you, they will get their money back. Um, they get a tax exemption on that investment. And so it's attractive for investors as well in that respect. And you know, Maine can take advantage of these historically low rates and the historically low uh, difference between taxable and tax exempt debt in order to make this transaction possible. Um, with respect to the challenges our utilities are facing right now, um, you know, I, I think uh, the, the problems that the economy has, the possibility that electricity consumption will go down um, is actually a good thing because it will help us to argue uh, in court that the utilities are not worth as much as they claim they are. So, you know, it kind of cuts both ways. Ultimately, you, you have to look at, you know, what, what is the uh, what, what is the revenue generating potential of a utility? That's how you set the, um, the acquisition price. You factor in the net book value as well. Um, but every argument um, that, that uh, really looks at the unique moment that we're in, um, every serious argument that I've seen weighs in favor of acting on this and doing it now. Thanks, Seth. Um, I know we're a little over eight, but if you have a couple more minutes, there's a few more questions here. Yep. Um, I just comments, uh, David Gibson mentioned a link for Maine Youth for Climate Justice on divesting from the public employee retirement system. That's on Thursday at one. And um, Jonathan mentioned the Green Bank uh, talk that is this next community conversation in two weeks. Um, Seth? The call asked, my neighbor Dana Dow has opined that we are likely to need something like $150 million for broadband as opposed to the $15 million bond issue on the November ballot. As chief sponsor of the so-called Dow bill, doesn't this provide an opportunity to engage those on the other side of the aisle in moving both LD1646 and DSG in general? DSG. I'm not sure what um, DSG. Well, um, I, I think I think generally the answer is yes. Um, the uh, the the need for high speed internet in the parts of Maine that are currently unserved or underserved is better understood now than it ever has been before. Uh, the digital divide has always existed, but it's really come into stark relief, and uh, people are understanding it in a way that they never have before. You know, we have some people on this call who we can't see. And it may be because they don't have good internet at home, and so they dialed in from a landline. They don't have access to these Zoom calls that, that, we're, that we're enjoying right now. I don't have it in my house. I live halfway between Portland and Augusta, and uh, just off the highway, and the top speed that I can access, no matter how much I'm willing to pay, um, is either satellite, which is awful, um, or DSL, which is three megabits per second down and one megabit per second up. That's a bonded DSL. It's actually better than what some DSL people can get. So um, it, it is, we, Maine is one of the worst states in the nation uh, for rural broadband access. And 
as I said earlier, if you own the poles, if you can make pole attachment cheaper, it's over a quarter of the cost to, to bring fiber to homes right now. Uh, we can make that one-time investment. Um, the Connect Main Authority, if you, if you haven't checked out the State Broadband Action Plan, um, which is linked from the Connect Main Authority website, I highly recommend it. Um, we have a real opportunity to connect these dots. And I think Seth is absolutely right. I'd like Dana Dow to be uh, the next champion of this, of this cause when I'm done. And uh, I'm actually, thanks, Seth. I'm just going to um, unmute. I found Seth who asked about the DSG and he had his hand up. Yeah. Go ahead, Seth. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Seth. Hey, hey, how are you doing? Uh, uh, DSG is distributed solar generation. Nothing oh, okay. radical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. It's all, it's all literally connected. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean... That's sort of the beauty of this. We're talking about poles and wires and everything is connected. And, and um, yes, distributed solar generation, also distributed um, efficiency, distributed storage, um, but all of those together, distributed energy resources, we call them, are absolutely critical. Um, and, a, and a consumer and utility is going to be willing to um, invest in those things and support those things where an investor and utility is not. Uh, and the reason for that is, is very simply um, because of the guaranteed return on equity that an uh, investor and utility has, their natural incentive is to overspend on infrastructure, to overspend on the big ticket items. Uh, for example, uh, a very large new transmission line. And we've seen, uh, we've seen those built recently and, and, and more proposed, including the, the corridor project. Um, those are the big opportunities that they like to chase after. And the problem with distributed energy renewables like solar and efficiency and, and uh, in-home storage is that you, um, you actually decrease the need to um, add more poles and wires and more expensive new transmission uh, 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 corridors. And that's where they make the big money. So they don't like it. Yeah. One of the things, can, can I be heard? I'll let Matt decide. Uh, just a quick follow-up. There's a couple more questions, um, and I just want to respect Seth's time. But yeah, go ahead, Seth. Yeah, you're on, Seth. Uh, thanks. One of the the uh, very attractive uh, opportunities I think we have is by virtue of the very low cost of investment capital right now, uh, combining it not only with the uh, the uh, uh, socialization of CMP in America uh, and, and uh, improving our broadband infrastructure, we, we potentially have the possibility to create a revolving fund through the same power authority for funding local, relatively small, three, five uh, megabyte, um, a megawatt uh, solar generation uh, facilities, as opposed, for example, to wind. Uh, mm -hmm. all over the state and, and it can be done, we can use the public power authority to leverage that financial ability to make small towns like mine, Waldeboro, able to put in a five megawatt, 10 megawatt uh, power plant, solar power plant, for example, uh, and in a way that's almost inconceivable until this point of low cost capital. That's a great point. Thank you, Seth. Yeah. Um, thank you, Seth. The Grayson had a question. In addition to green energy production, do you see the need to start building sea level rise and other climate change related mitigation infrastructure now? Is that something on anyone's radar in the legislature? So that's a great question, Grayson. Thank you so much. And yes, uh, there is a huge need for um, adaptation. And um, I, th I think the grid the, the, one of the principal challenges to our, um, our hope of electrifying everything and uh, providing all of our transportation and building heating and cooling and industrial energy needs uh, through the electrical wires is that we do have the worst reliability in the nation, at least as of 2017. Uh, and that means we have the longest and the most frequent outages. 
So think about that. You know, we're, we're a cold state. You know, if it's the middle of, uh, of January and you have a two week outage and you're depending on an electrical heat pump to heat your home, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of up the creek, right? And um, likewise in the summer, you know, if you need refrigeration for your medications, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be depending on, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the electrical grid. You're gonna have to go and get a generator. Some people can't afford that. Um, there are all kinds of ways that um, reliability matters. Um, if, if people are going to be confident enough to get an electrical ve electric vehicle um, to charge every night at their home so they can get to work the next day, they also want to have the power on. So reliability is critical. I think sea level rise is part of the challenge for the electrical grid. Um, certainly the rocky peninsulas of Maine um, are uh, very, very prone to outages. A lot of that is just because of high winds and the soil conditions. We do have, um, you know, a lot of trees and they're shallow rooted on rocky soil. Um, so you end up with a, a, a very significant challenge for any power utility. That will also be true of a consumer owned utility. But the nice thing about consumer owned utilities is they can make those investments at a lower cost and they pay attention to the lower voltage distribution system that goes out and serves the 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 hinterland uh the willy wax if you will um because they understand that's their job they're not they're not chasing after big new lucrative transmission corridors like the hydro quebec proposal they're focusing on how can we serve our customers better and that's the reason that on a national basis, consumer-owned utilities around the country have better than twice the reliability that uh, the investor-owned utilities have. That's also true in Maine. Um, just a quick example, in that last storm that we had um, a week and a half ago, I guess it was, um, the town of Madison, Maine, um, had a very stark contrast between the folks who are served by Madison Electric Works and the folks who are served by CMP. Um, roughly 1,650 customers in Madison have CMP, um, not by choice. Believe me, they don't want it, but it's, they're, they're, they're stuck. And, uh, and, and another half or so are served by uh, Madison Electric Works. For the half that were served by uh, Central Maine Power, three, excuse me, 85% uh, of them lost their power on, on Friday morning. And uh, many of them did not get it back until Monday. For the folks next door, across the street in some cases, who are served by Madison Electric Works, uh, with even more customers actually, Madison Electric Works had only 3% of their customers without power. Again, that was 85% in Central Maine Power's part of the town only 3% without power, and they had everybody back by lunchtime the same day, lunchtime on Friday. So instead of three or four days, it was three or four hours to get everybody back. And that is common. I, I oh, In every storm, I call around, I ask how the consumer-owned utilities are doing. Um, their reliability statistics are not reported the same way, um, but here in Maine, they also have a much better track record. Part of that is investing in the distribution system with things like that insulated tree wire that I mentioned, um, but these are the kinds of adaptations that we need for the grid in order to confront a, a, a future that will have a lot more severe weather. And, and any electrical grid, um, to be reliable in severe weather, must be uh, very, very robust and very well maintained. I'll stop there. Great, thanks. Um, and I'm just going to push, Jonathan, I'm going to push your question uh, down just in the interest of time. I have one quick one for you, Seth, and then um, one about rural, our rural part of the state. What is the present value of future CMP earnings? Maybe this isn't a quick one from Mel. Um, it, that's, that's very debatable. It really depends on, on many, many factors. One of those is the, um, the extent to which we're successful in electrifying the economy. Um, obviously, the earnings will be greater um, if, we, if we electrify more. Um, it's also very subject uh, to the um, allowed rate of return, um, but generally speaking, those will those will be within a, a predictable range of roughly nine percent to thirteen percent, depending on distribution or transmission. 
Um, so, I mean, they make, they make very good money. You know, they make, they make tens of millions of dollars every year. Um, and, uh, some years, uh, they, they, they get an especially high rate of return, uh, because the, the, the regulators may have overlooked something, um, or they were able to cut corners, maybe not, not trim as many trees and, and, uh, and pocket that money for their investors. So the, the, the answer, um, is unfortunately, uh, not easy to put a number on. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a substantial, um, a substantial future profit. And that is what we would be removing by creating a uh, consumer owned utility, keeping that money here in the state instead of uh, sending it overseas. Great. Um, Lynn had a question, obviously public transportation figures into reducing our fu fossil fuel usage. What new initiatives, if any, do you know of that address this, particularly for public um, public increasing transportation in rural Maine? So I, I'm a huge fan of public transportation. I was fortunate um, in the 1990s um, to uh, live and teach in New York City, and I was just a I was so fortunate to to um, not have to own a car. I didn't. I moved back home to Maine uh, when I was in my 30s. I, I think I bought my first car when I was 32 years old, um, and it was just incredible to be able to to take the the subway or the bus, um, the robust public transportation system. It is harder in a rural area, but we have, you know, for example, in the Augusta region, um, the Kennebec uh, Explorer uh, buses, and I think if more of us use them, um, that will help that that fleet can be transitioned um to hydrogen to um electricity um you know that i that is a system that is um generally uh not going to be governed by uh the utilities whether that's telecommunications or uh electrical utilities but it's an investment that i think uh, communities and the state need to make and, um, you know, no question, um, rethinking our transportation systems is a very important part of the climate puzzle. I know the transportation uh, working group of the Climate Council is working hard on some of those things. Um, you know, I'd also, as I mentioned earlier, like to see us um, not commute to begin with, but rather uh, be able to work from home, study from home, um, visit our doctor from home. And I think that will help to cut down on vehicle miles traveled as well. But great, great question about public transportation. I'm a big supporter of it and um, appreciate your support as well. All right. And um, if you're up for it, two more. I probably said that a couple of times, but um, I, people are I really did, engaged. I, this is great stuff. I didn't, I didn't get the text yet that I'm supposed to go uh, pick up dinner. So I'm good. Okay. Um, how can we direct the wave of stimulus we hope is coming on some of these more green issues, broadband, RT? How can we direct the stimulus? Yeah, I think that's the question. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, obviously, the stimulus in Washington right now, everybody's focused on, you know, the paycheck protection uh, funds and um, you know, kind of really short term measures to just stabilize people um, and uh, prevent the pandemic from, you know, literally um, causing people to, to starve. Um, I, I do hope that we get to a point where there's a big federal investment. And I think, you know, encouraging our delegate, get, you know, getting people like Sarah Gideon or, you know, Betsy Sweet, you know, somebody other than, uh, um, Senator Collins uh, into office in the U.S. Senate would make a big difference. I think Angus King, you know, is very open to those kinds of suggestions, and certainly Shelley and Jared. Um, but but giving forwarding, uh, you know, creative ideas to them would be great. Um, and then within the um, the the main uh, sphere of influence where I uh, do my work, I think that you know this conversation we're having today is absolutely about that. We will not have a lot of money sitting around to make um, tax supported investments. We may be able to do some general fund bonding, the kinds of bonds that you vote on um, uh, you know, at the polls. 
Uh, but the real opportunity, I think, is revenue bonds. And the, these, with the bonds I'm talking about for um, you know, taking over the power utilities and making investments in clean energy generation and storage and efficiency and broadband, uh, these are not tax dollars we're talking about. You can do this outside of the tax system. Uh, and that's important because in a depression or a recession, you, you have fewer tax dollars to spend. It is much, much harder. If you think about it, the entire state budget is dependent on, on basically two sources of revenue, sales taxes and income taxes. And when sales are down, sales taxes are down. When incomes are down, income taxes are down. And we have a, we have a balanced budget requirement in the state constitution. So every, every dollar that we spend, we have to say where we're gonna get it from. So it's go these are going to be a very, very hard, um, I would say two, four, six years um, hopefully not more than that, budgetarily in the state. And any stimulus coming from the state is going to have to be outside of the tax system to really be as robust as we would like it to be uh, to create jobs and uh, re-energize the economy. But that's what we need. Um, and that's what I'm going to keep working on, hopefully with your support. Great. And uh, the last one that relates to that is, uh, what is the approximate difference between for-profit utilities, financial costs, and consumer-owned utility capital costs, how much money is it estimated to cost to decarbonize Maine's economy? Yeah, so a, a good rule of thumb is um, that it costs about twice as much to make uh, an, an investor-owned investment than a consumer-owned investment. Um, just historically, um, the, the difference is roughly between 3% uh, annualized cost of capital and 8% annualized cost of capital. So if you amortize that out over 20 years, it, it ends up being roughly a, a, a twofold difference. So just kind of ballpark, back of the envelope, um, Dr. Richard Silkman has uh, produced a book, which I highly recommend to you. It's linked at that um, main power bit.ly link. Um, and, and he has really mapped out as a clean, as an energy economist has mapped out what it would take to completely decarbonize Maine's economy by 2050. And he's not, he's not, you know, kind of going halfway. He's, he's really looking at, at the, the deepest decarbonization. Um, no, no kind of, you know, uh, tricks like, you know, importing power from Hydro Quebec and taking credit for that, even though Massachusetts already bought it. Um, or you know any anything any other uh, tricks that that people use sometimes to account for um, clean energy that they really shouldn't. Um, so it's a very honest look at how we get there fully. Um, Dr. Silkman says that um, we can between now and 2050 completely decarbonize Maine's economy by electrifying everything by making uh, all the investment in the grid and in, uh, in generation um, through a consumer owned approach. That's at the 3% interest rate. So he, he says that that will be affordable. Um, he, but he literally budgets it. And by 2050, we, we would be making the same roughly $6 billion a year investment over time, but diverting some of what we spend on fossil fuels each year into new investment in the grid and in generation. Um, if you were to do that with an investor owned model, it would cost you twice as much. So instead of $6 billion a year, we'd be spending $12 billion a year and uh, do that between now and 2050. And basically we would, we would break the bank within the first few years and we would not get to the destination. So I, I hope that helps with the, sort of the rough um, ballpark of, of the, the, differ, the cost differential. Um, you know, it, it really is the difference between success or failure. Great. Wow. Um, well, this was very helpful. I'm really glad uh, so many people have stayed on even past our original time. Um, thank you very much, Seth, for your time. And um, I hope this went pretty well. This was my first time uh, trying to facilitate the chat. So I hope I got everyone's questions and thank you for um, being patient. Um, yeah. And I will have another 
one of these in two weeks and um, we'll send out, as Seth said, um, more some uh, follow up email with these resources as well. But I think a lot of them are in the chat. Um, Very well. If, if I may, but Matt, thank I, you again. I just want to say thank yeah. you again to all of you, to the Sierra Club, to everybody that joined tonight. Um, if you're not already on my e email list, um, there there is a, a way to sign up for that as well, I believe, from the uh, bit.ly link and um, and from that that website that we're still working on. Please do um, stay tuned and also um, support the Sierra Club. You know, uh, absolutely donate to the, the um, consumer and utility effort, but also support the Sierra Club. Um, you guys do tremendous work and um, I'm, uh, I'm uh, very, very honored to be um, one of your first, first community conversations. Um, happy Earth Day to everyone um, tomorrow and uh, let's make 2020 a great year despite the initial challenges.